U.S. Farm Reports, a public information program brought to you in the interest of agriculture, rural business, and the well-being of our nation by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area and others interested in having American agriculture receive cost of production plus a reasonable profit. American farmers and ranchers are building a brighter future for agriculture through the National Farmers Organization, the organization that awoke America and represents the leadership of agriculture. U.S. Farm Report now presents a dialogue from Rochester as the Rochester, Minnesota Chamber of Commerce launches its first agribusiness day with economists, businessmen, and farmers participating. We will hear two of the important speakers of this event, Ray Ani, a banker from southern Minnesota and a member of the committee that arranged this conference, and Earhart Fingston, national vice president of the NFO. And acting as host is Phil Allen, veteran farm news analyst heard on many radio and television programs. The dialogue in Rochester played to an over overflow crowd at one of the biggest hotels in this growing community in southern Minnesota. It's unusual in the fact that uh, there's a heavy snow cover in southern Minnesota, as there is in a great deal of the northern part of the Middle West at the time of this important conference. I think it was significant because it's one of a type. Uh, Mr. Oni, I'm sure, will bear me out on this point that chambers of commerce, agricultural economists, businessmen, and farmers are gathering this season. I expect you folks in the television audience can note other communities where they've had similar conferences on a similar subject. At Rochester, in their first agribusiness day, they asked the question, collective bargaining? And uh, 831 turning out uh, through the snows to hear this discussion. Well, the overflow crowd was, uh, part of them were fed at one of the nearby hotels across the street. And then they stayed all during the afternoon to talk about this important question. Uh, we're going to raise some questions on the program. Is it because the alternatives to collective bargaining seem to be disappearing? Is it because agriculture's condition now is such that uh, business people and farmers, well, one spokesman put it this way, uh, we all sink together or survive together. I'm going to uh, apply a number of questions to Mr. Oni, who is a banker and a businessman. You were a member of the committee that helped promote this, weren't you, Mr. Oni? That's correct. And your bank, uh, as I understand it, is a member of the Independent Bankers yes, Association. Yes, we're an independent bank, by all means. Oh, what might you say to this audience about the condition of uh, agriculture as you've seen it through the years in financing farm operations? Well, I might say, uh, Going back, long, long ways back to 1922, when I first started in on my first job as an ag teacher, I'd like to make this statement that uh, there's never been a time when it's been so difficult for a young man to get started farming as it, as it is at the present time, uh, very definitely. And of course, a high capitalization, uh, the uh, large amount of money it takes to get started farming, we used to think in terms of $7,500,000, well, now the minimum is almost $100,000. $50,000 with the price of land uh, that they're asking. And this price of land is going up because the larger uh, operators are bidding it up. And of course, some outside buyers come in, use it as an inflation hedge. So uh, that's a problem. The land's getting so high priced that uh, with the income that's available, it's almost impossible to pay for these farms. When a farmer comes into your bank to borrow for either for his operating expenses or for any other purpose of renewing or enlarging, does it seem to you that the loan that you might make to the farmer also affects the rest of the community life? Yes, I think very definitely. And of course, these uh, farms are getting bigger. Uh, during the past 12 years, I can think of about uh, 110 different farmers that, have, uh, that we have loaned money to for uh, the down payment on the adjoining 80, 160 acres. And uh, that is the enlargement. I can think of a couple that are on their sixth and seventh farm. It just goes to show what's happening. I mean, the bigger ones are getting bigger, buying up the neighboring farms, and some of these smaller ones are passing out of existence and becoming part-time farms. The price structure that the farmer receives, of course, that's highly important to a banker making a loan, isn't it? The price that he gets because that enables yes. him to repay the loan. Very definitely. We do a lot of budgeting. We got to figure out uh, some of these loans running uh, over $100,000. Uh, we have to do quite a bit of figuring uh, as to the income and the expenses and uh, 
You know, after all, we're only about number three on the uh, getting uh, payments on his loan. He's first got to pay operating expenses. Uh, he's got to support his family. And then if there's anything left, well, we may get some of that to reduce the loan. And that's where uh, many of them get short. We hear some talk these days about the efficiency of uh, farmers and uh, whether getting efficient or being larger is a help in survival of the farm. Does, does it seem to you there's a correlation? Well, we hear so much about getting larger and getting larger. I was county agent for a good many years, and I was involved in uh, some of those programs, farm planning and all that, and that was uh, pretty much the uh, thing they talked about. Uh, you got to get larger. You got to milk more cows. You got to keep more sows and all that. Well, the good question is how large can you get? But definitely there's some of these people getting larger that certainly have their financial problems. You've described the serious condition, Mr. Oni, and yet you were part of the uh, part of the workings of this community, Rochester, one of the best favored in the northern Middle West, that uh, proposed to have a conference today about collective bargaining. Does it seem to you that this is a, a hopeful solution or part of the solution? Oh, I think very definitely. This meeting that we had here at Rochester, uh, the first uh, uh, rural urban meeting, agribusiness meeting, uh, I think definitely uh, meant a great deal. And, uh, you know, these businessmen, they need a lot of education, and quite a few of those. Uh, well, we had the Rotary and Kiwanis and Lions Club. They were all there at noon for their regular meeting. Yes, I meeting. noticed they were. You had wide over. But, you know, they, uh, they, uh, they don't know what's going on, many of these businessmen. They were even born and raised out there on the farm years ago, but they, they don't know what's happening as far as the financial problems of the uh, farmers concerned. That is, uh, many of them don't. Of course, a few do, but uh, that's the situation. I'd like to uh, get back to one or two more of these points, Mr. Arnie, about the increasing understanding business people can have of this. I'd like to turn to Mr. Fingston, who is the vice president of the NFO. He was one of the speakers on the panel. Uh, I think that uh, you may again compare this to a conference like this you may have had nearby your city or your community, where farm organi organization leaders participated. Uh, Mr. Fingston, does it seem to you that uh, collective bargaining as a question to center these conferences on is the proper focus for these times, or, or well, what? I think very definitely. I don't think that there's any thinking man or any progressive man that doesn't realize that from time to time, any business, any industry has to make changes, or it's going to stagnate or even uh, get complete destruction. And I think the thinking farmers in the United States very definitely realize that it has to be done. I think they're more and more coming to realize that it's not going, the problem's not going to solve itself because the situation has been deteriorating steadily for the last 15 years. And I think this thought is gone now that they can just sit back and wait for itself to correct. So I think that the thinking, the progressive farmers are definitely ready for a change and they are of course joining NFO in vast numbers for collective bargaining to get a voice in establishing their own price. And this, of course, is the big failure in agriculture. The farmer is operating in a very highly organized economy, and yet he, as an individual, goes to the market and asks these modernized uh, national buyers what it pleases them to pay. He says, what will you give me? Well, I don't think it takes very much thinking to realize that when you consider that every corporation in this nation was set up for one purpose and one purpose only, and that's to make a profit, that they soon realize that they can't continue to go to those people and ask them what it pleases them to pay and hope to get a fair price. It just isn't in the cards. So I'd say that uh, definitely the trend is re reversing. Uh, I mean, the thinking in so far as that they have to do something about it. We have, well, more than doubled the area in which we're organized, and of course these are bigger and bigger farmers all together. So there is, uh, in my opinion, a definite movement toward collective bargaining. Do you feel that time is on the side of the, of the great thrust toward collective bargaining? Is time playing on the side of uh, getting together and bargaining for a price? At the present time, it looks that the time is there. If things keep moving as they have been, but I think that we are probably in a much, much more critical time situation than most people care to realize. 
And I think they had better do it fast and take no chances on whether there is time or not. Yes, what Mr. Oni is describing here shows that there is certainly a situation that is confronting not only farmers, but the whole business life of the... Well, the rural community's got to go with it. If the farmers go out, that's the customers of the rural community. And what is there left after you lose those? So I say this is probably part of the reason why right now our homes are not what they once were. We've got sons, daughters, or grandchildren that have gone to the East Coast, the West Coast, leaving the Midwest. Well, this continues. What's it going to stand on? I noticed there was a good bit of agreement in principle at the discussion today. Uh, the ag economists uh, mentioned it, and so did the farm organization leaders. And I got the impression there is a good bit of uh, agreement in principle that collective bargaining is, is here, it must be expanded and developed. And yet, I, I heard you address yourself specifically to a question, Mr. Fingston, about uh, the type of collective bargaining the NFO has, been, has put together under the Capra Volstead Act. Would you comment a bit about that? What sort of a structure collective bargaining should have? Well, of course, you have to recognize the condition under which we're marketing, where our buyers are national in scope, can bypass any area any market, any individual, and actually pit one against the other. So the farmer is totally helpless. If he as an individual refuses to take the price that is being offered through the national organization, he's got no place to go. He's helpless. So a farmer goes to the market and says, what will you give me? Well, to get out of that situation, he has to become a businessman and conduct his business of marketing exactly the way every good industry and business in this nation has always done it, to set his own price, a price based on what it costs to produce. This is the first thing. Sell it under contract, at least a year ahead, and then produce for that contract. Now, in order to do that, it takes a national organization because it's a national problem. Even a local group, see, can be bypassed just as easily as an individual does. So it takes a national organization for that reason. It takes an organization dealing in all commodities, bringing them all up in relative balance, because if you try to do it by individual commodities, let's say each group go its own way, then you're going to have a shifting into that, because they're not going to lose money in one field. If there's a good profit in the other, they're going to shift to it, and that'll destroy that or any gains that you might have made. Then I think the next thing, an organization that looks after the whole problem. And this we have in the NFO, not just the pricing, but sees to it that the excess production is taken care of. So it has to be a surplus disposal set up. So the program of the NFO in the next step would be through the console, a control of the sale of the production, supply the market with all that it can use at a full fair price, but no more. See, this has been our failing in the past. We have let any excess production establish the price on all of it. In other words, the last pound of production that we had set the price on the very first pound. So control the sale, supply the market with all that it'll pay a full fair price for, but no more. Then if you have any excess uh, beyond that, channel that into world markets, secondary markets, or let's say at a discount rate, but don't take that discount on the entire year's production. And failing to be able to move it, then isolate it from the market so that it cannot be used to, uh, let's say, destroy the price structure. Aren't there examples of this in other businesses? Don't they do this with their with Oh, their yes. Products? Uh, I don't think there's any business. I think you have it every day. Your merchant, he sets his price. Any customer goes in there, he's either going to pay that price or he don't get that production. Now, we're used to year-end sales. They buy quite a ways ahead. They'll buy six months to a year ahead. I'm talking about department stores and so forth. They buy for the next season. Well, if they have anything left, let's take shirts, for example. They have shirts left at the end of the year. Sure, they'll sell out what they have at a discount, but they don't start selling the entire new delivery at a lower <laughs> price because they've got some left. So uh, I think this is very important. And then, of course, the final point that no organization can ever do this under is if they're not ready to use the power of the production itself. This is the only power that there is in bargaining, is the control of that production. Let them have it, and they pay a fair price for it. Don't let them have it if they refuse. And this, and of course, will effect, eventually reflect itself in contracts. 
Once you're contracting on a year ahead, they either contract or they're out of business. So uh, the, the production itself has to be used for the power. And of course, you don't start any year off without any production in agriculture. You always have production there. So it's going to take a holding action in some form or another to break that pattern. You have to, first of all, show that you've got the pressure. And the only way you can do it is with the power of the production itself. I heard you reply to one question. Uh, I suppose it was asked in the, in the form of whether, uh, whether uh, supply management has to be accomplished by law and whether there needs to be enabling legislation for collective bargaining and all of that. Uh, could you say uh, some things on the subject of the NFO with reference to farm programs, for example, and with reference to possible legislation in the field of collective bargaining? Well, we, we can and are using the present farm programs, the uh, loan set up and uh, the government programs. We are using them to an advantage in our programs. And I think that the farmer should cooperate in those programs. It does very definitely stiffen our hand at this particular time. And I think it would be a catastrophe to eliminate those programs until the farmer was ready to run his own program and do his own pricing. Now, as for the additional legislation that they're talking about, or an enabling legislation, you've never heard that out of the NFO. The NFO does not need additional legislation. We have all that we need. This is the reason that we had to build an entirely new organization to comply with the laws that are in existence. Didn't the, the NFO brief on the Capra Volstead Act before even organizing the structure? I should hope to tell you we did and by all the experts in the legal field that we could get a hold of. I think the Sunkist uh, decision by the Supreme Court just a few months ago brought that out very clearly, where the Supreme Court denied them the exemption from the antitrust laws granted by virtue of Capra Volstead Act, that they had, I think the figure used was 15% non-producing members in their organization. And they, uh, they lost on that basis. This is the reason, see, why we have never let anybody but farmers into our organization or producers of farm products. And this is also the reason why we don't go into business. See, this is another gray area. So there really wasn't any organization at all that could go into that field without very decidedly changing the structure of the organization. And that's one of the things that makes ours different than the others is we are set up on the basis of the laws now in existence. So we don't need enabling legislation. And this seems to be the concern of others that they'd like to have a legislation so that they too can get into the field. One more question before I turn back to one thing I'd like to develop a bit further with Mr. Ani. Uh, since you've described a kind of a, a unique and sharply focused attitude of the NFO toward bargaining and only bargaining, then uh, is the NFO really in conflict with any of the other farm organizations? No, there's no conflict at all. Uh, the other organizations were set up to bring farmers services of various kinds. They've done this, they've done it well, but they're not set up for collective bargaining. Again, this is why we had to build an entirely new organization that was set up for that, and it is our only program. So there is no conflict here with any other group or individual that honestly wants farmers to have a fair price. There just simply cannot be because there is no conflict in any area for anybody that wants farmers to have a fair price. We are not asking the government to do the job for us. We're asking the farmers to do it themselves, to be businessmen, to run their industry the way the automobile company, the way every big uh, business runs theirs. So there can't be any conflict if a man is really and truly honest in wanting the farmers to have a fair price. So I suppose a rancher or a farmer could uh, belong to his own organization that he has for years, or several of them, and also be an NFO member. That's right. Uh, see, they still need the services that other groups are providing. The fact that they join NFO isn't going to relieve the necessity of those uh, services. But they also need a price. So we're not asking them to desert their present organization, but asking them to join ours for the purpose of getting a price. So ours really is every farmer's organization. There's no conflict here, political or otherwise, because this is the only program of the NFO to get farmers a price. So it's not going to be a sideline with us. It is everything to us. Uh, one of the best points you made, it seemed to me, during the luncheon at uh, today's Rochester Agribusiness Day was the 
interdependence of town and country, Mr. Orney. Uh, could you say a bit more about that? Uh, do you feel that the city man needs the farmer as much as the farmer needs the city man? Well, very definitely, no question about that. I think uh, on various occasions we notice that the farmers aren't buying the machinery, uh, buying various consumer goods because they don't have the income. That shows up every once in a while, no question about that. They're very much dependent on each other. I'd like to ask, uh, raise one question here. Uh, you know, the high cost of money now at the present time, 7% uh, on federal land bank loans and 7.5-8% on operating loans. And according to a statement uh, made at the uh, uh, meeting, uh, the average earnings are less than 5%. Well, how are you going to pay 7-8% on a major part of your capital investment if you're only earning 5%? That's a good question. It certainly is. You had some figures on that today, didn't you, Mr. Fingston? Yes, the figures I was using were... Uh, from the economic indicator. In fact, I have them here. And that is on the sale of the farm production. And the figures I was using were 68 or 67 figures because the 68 figures are not complete. But the sale of all farm production in the United States was for $42.8 billion. The production expenses were 34.8. So we had actually uh, $8 billion profit on the sale of our production. Our investment in that same year was 274. So that figures out actually less than 3%. And of course, there's other things too that they do figure in. They figure uh, non-money income for me living in my own home, you know, uh -huh. and uh, that sort of thing. Assuming that, that the firewood you burn from your own wood lot is income. Yes, the, <laughs> yes. Fire, uh, the wood I'm burning in my electric range and in my gas furnace. And that's how you could get 8.5 billion from the sale of commodities when the Ag Department figures for what they called net income for that year was around 14, wasn't it? That's right, 14.2. Part of this was government payments. Government payments would be in there and then the rest of it is all monkey business figured in. I think Mr. Orney has a point here. You were, you were mentioning, now if it's below 5%, if you count in even the 14 billion or with 8.5 billion as from the sale of farm commodities. Then Mr. Fingston said at the meeting today that that would figure less than 3% well, return on an investment. Now, as a banker, what problems do you see there? Well, whether it's 3% <laughs> or 5% when they're paying uh, 7 to 8% for uh, yes. uh, operating capital. Remember, in many of these uh, uh, farms, uh, the uh, borrowed money probably represents two-thirds of the entire capital structure. So it just isn't uh, just impossible to uh, come out on that kind of a uh, situation. Am I correct in, in, in understanding that you have said that two-thirds of the capital structure for farmers and ranchers is borrowed money? Well, uh, probably not uh, overall, but certainly many of these uh, beginners, oh, once in a while it gets down to three-fourths. Oh, gets that high, yes. Mm -hmm. and of course, there's where we have problems, uh, lending money to those with a low uh, equity, very definitely. Uh, I, I heard you mention a few minutes before we went on the camera that a cattleman might face this problem, and let's see, how are, how are you going into his problem there? You probably help finance cattle operations. Oh, yes. Well, you mean the uh, interest? Uh, that was yes. my figure. Yeah, I think uh, Mr. Fingston had a figure on that. Yes, uh, this is, of course, uh, see in the, my home area where we buy cattle and we borrow all the money, usually from our banker to feed them. Well. Uh, where we got into this discussion, there are predictions that by July we might, might very well be up to 10% interest. And the point that I was making in that case, the man who borrows his money to buy and to feed cattle is going to have to give one out of every 10 of those cattle yes. just for the use of the money. Yes, when he thinks of it in, that, in those terms, he'd be giving away one out of ten cattle. Wouldn't and he? when a cattle feeder starts thinking of that, it is an utter impossibility to make any money. Then you're clear past the 3% and the 5% that we That somehow pay. looks a great deal more real than just figuring out a percentage. That's return. right. Too often, I think, we're so used to figures they kind of escape us, just like this method of marketing that we're in, this going and asking, what will you give me, and then wondering why we're not getting a price. I think we're, uh, we've lived with it so long and so close to it that it's kind of grown on us. We can't let loose of it. Or you might say we're so close to the forest, we can't see the forest on account of the trees. And so it does have to be pointed out. Mr. Orney, did you have any other observation that you wanted to make here from the standpoint of, the, of a businessman working well, uh, with? 
When we work out budgets with these farmers, all the costs are going up every year. Taxes are going higher. Tractors are higher priced. Combines are higher priced. Uh, everything's going up. So the squeeze is getting uh, uh, tighter and tighter. And the only way out is to get a higher price from what the farmer sells. Yes, and when you think of it in those terms, you mention some of the things you're mentioning are the very lifeblood of a community, in, at least in this part of the country where agriculture is the principal industry, as it is in vast stretches of America. When you talk about not being able to buy cars or tractors, you're talking about the very survival of the community. That's you? right, very definitely. Every, every businessman in the rural area is certainly dependent on the farmer, and he's interested in the price that that farmer gets, very definitely. Well, am I right in assuming that what you're talking about is quite a large number of transactions, which means that the whole experience of your business is based on family agriculture, isn't it? That's right. So even though you could produce a, a sufficient or an equal quantity of food and fiber, with the farmers leaving and going to cause the continental tilt by leaving for the West Coast, this would reduce the number of transactions in your... Oh, absolutely. No question about that. I might mention one thing. Uh, you know, our grandfathers and our fathers, they were used to paying for farms by making sacrifices. They held off buying this and buying that. Well, in this day and age, uh, uh, you can't expect a rural family to uh, make too many sacrifices, trying to make farm payments and all that. Uh, after all, they uh, should live uh, the same as people uh, working, having jobs in the city. Absolutely. Yeah, very definitely. Just a sense of justice. That's right. Uh, I'd like to close on this note, since your committee helped form uh, a discussion on the subject of collective bargaining, and since the NFO has made some strides in the direction of building actual structures for collective bargaining, could you say one or two things about this, Mr. Fingston? Do you look upon it with uh, optimism and in, in what w has been accomplished so far? Oh, very definitely. We're way beyond having built structures. We're not only talking about collective bargaining, we're doing it. Through our holding action last year, we did break through in livestock. We now have three of the major packers under contract. This was a result of the, of the holding action. We have in many, many areas now breakthrough on grain. These are popping so fast that one man can't even keep track of them anymore. And certainly in the Northwest, in the potato industry, where they were getting 80 cents a uh, hundred for their potatoes last year, are right now contracting under NFO for four and a quarter for number ones, two and a quarter for, or 240, I believe it is, for number two, and on the B or the small potato that they used to get as little as 15 cents a ton for, I heard about they that. are now contracting for a dollar, a hundred on those. That's way over a mm -hmm. thousand percent increase. So we're not only talking about it, we're doing it. We're, we're going. This program has been a discussion of collective bargaining, which is the first topic of an annual Agribusiness Day promoted here in southern Minnesota. I've been talking with Mr. Ray uh, Awney, who is a businessman in this area and the vice president of the NFO, Earhart Fingston. That for today is something to think about. U.S. Farm Reports has presented a dialogue from Rochester with Mr. Ray Awney, southern Minnesota banker and member of the Agribusiness Committee of the Rochester Chamber of Commerce and Mr. Earhart Fingston, National Vice President of the NSO. Moderator was Phil Allen. Members of the National Farmers Organization invite you to tune in again next week at this time for more facts on agriculture and rural America, the gear wheel in our economy that produces the majority of our nation's new wealth. The farm income pattern sets the nation's prosperity, and the National Farmers Organization represents new thinking in a new generation of agricultural producers, a brighter day, for American agriculture.